In a world of Johnny's, Timmy's, and Spike's, we must all arrive at the win condition. You buy a box, you could open all foil for our lands. But you've got your favorite, which is, of course, Spike Tournament Grinder. If you don't have any Nagiris and you want them, now is definitely a great time to go and pick them up. Boom! Baron Von Count, human villain. That's awkward. Could you imagine a Spike Grizzle brand? Hello again, and welcome back to the Wind Condition Podcast, where we talk all things Magic the Gathering. My name is Sean, I'm your host, I'm joined by my co-host Greg. How's it going, Greg? Doing okay there, guys. Awesome. Excellent. Well, we have got some fun stuff to talk about today, a um, little bit of Unstable, as well as dun, 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 listener email. That's mm-hmm. right. Uh, but before we get into all that, Greg, how has your week been going? It's been pretty good. Been busy. Not working at work, though. I mean, the holidays are really slow for us. <laughs> Speaking of holidays, are you all done with your Christmas shopping? Um, I guess. <laughs> I, I mean, to be honest, I haven't really gone out and bought anything. So Okay. All right. Well, my wonderful wife has made sure that all the Christmas shopping was taken care of, I want to say, pretty much in November. So oh, we're pretty much the yin and the yang. I'm kind of the fly by the seat of my pants, easy going guy, and she's the planner slash executor. So we make a good team. But that works out then. Yeah. Yeah. You know who else makes a great team? Anybody? Uh, me and you. Anybody and Flipside Gaming at flipsidegaming.com, where you can order any singles or sealed magic product, other gaming products as well. And if your order is over $10 and you use that promo code WINCONDITION in all caps, it'll save you 10% off of your purchase and help us fund our future show giveaways. Yeah. All right. So, Greg, we got a brand spanking new set upon us that everyone is excited about. Dude, so many people are playing it at my local store. It's kind of funny. It's actually pretty nuts. So why don't we head into the main phase? Greg, there were some people who were a little nervous about the success of Unstable, but... I think those people might be eating their words right about now. Oh my gosh, are they ever. Um, We were all speculating if Unstable is going to hold any value past the first month. I mean, we already saw it when it was first announced before anybody started open product. Most of the cards, except for like five of them, were 50 cents. Right. Or nine cents for some of the commons and uncommon. So there was no value at all in any of the cards. The lands was the only thing, which were anywhere from three to six bucks. Yep, all the value was expected to be soaked up by the lands. Yeah. And it really did. Right. But it, not in the fashion we were ever expecting. No. No, not at all. Yeah. And, I mean, like you're saying, beyond the lands, you're not really seeing many cards pulling a serious price tag i think the most expensive card in the set correct me if i'm wrong but i think it's the urza headmaster planeswalker like eight bucks yeah 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 um but yeah most all the other cards if you're into cubing and you know you don't get the opportunity to draft don't fret you could probably go out and pick yourself up a bunch of singles of unstable for reasonable prices better than reasonable actually definitely i mean the the next card was Sword and Dungeon Dragons at five. Yep. And then your lands. Yeah. Yeah. And uh funny funny thing about the land, Greg, I mean these are absolutely gorgeous, full art, borderless John Avon lands. Yeah, they are. And what's even more rare are to get those foil full art John Avon unstable lands. Um but there's something else out there too. Well, there there are some definitely some crazy things. So you've got the uh, that steam flogger boss, 
Right. Um, which, as you guys know, fits in the land slot, and it's supposed to be drafted like a normal card. Um, but the crazy thing about this card is the foil version of it. Um, if you were to open a foil version out of Unstable, they are selling online for around 300 bucks. That's yeah, insane. No. Uh, I mean, for a card that's $2 out of Planar Chaos solely on the fact that people collect it, that's an insane price jump. Right. Right. Um, so, I mean, there's a couple factors at play here because, I mean, <laughs> Unstable is, like we were saying, not the most valuable set when you come to the actual cards, but... Also, like we were saying, people like cubes. They like to foil out their cubes. So these yeah. foils are definitely sought after, but to a point where it's it's unheard of. Like you're saying, Steamflogger boss, multiple hundreds of dollars. Um, foil cryptic, uh, sorry, foil very cryptic command. One of the versions, again, several hundred dollars. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple factors at work here, and unfortunately, uh, I don't really have the time and I don't think Greg does either to really break down the hard percentages but I mean let's take into consideration how these sets work and how these foils usually work um, so there's 216 ish, ish. <laughs> cards in this set um, <laughs> and that's not far off from a regular set you know 200 no. X cards yeah um, I think it's normally around what 250 um, yeah at least modern big sets, like modern sets. The, the older stuff, uh, there's some definitely outrageous uh, set, like like card numbers. Right, right. So, in addition to that, we also were surprised with the printing of multiple versions of cards, mm -hmm. with varying art, varying power and toughness, varying rules text. Um, Varying, um, uh, 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 God, what was the other thing that was varying? I don't remember now. Converted mana cost? No, the CMCs yeah. all stayed the same. Oh, points, flavor text. abilities. Yeah, I think it was just flavor text. It's, it's flavor text, abilities, um, nothing's, uh, super types changed, um, and the mana's all changed. So, yeah, it was just rules text, flavor text, uh, and art. Right. So, with a card like Very Cryptic Command, it gets uh, it gets pretty nuts because you already have the the first spoiled version, um, which had the four different modes, and it said mm -hmm. you know choose two. Well, when you take that and you introduce, is it four other versions Five. of the card? There was six of them. In so total. okay, so six total versions of this rare card, um, all of which do different things, one of which has different art. Um, well, the one that has different art is really special. It is. Well, why don't you tell us why it's special, Greg? Um, well, it's mostly special because of the fact that the artist that started uh, working on it never got to finish it because he passed away. Right. Sadly, uh, so uh, it, it got, um, not only was it that, they got a, a play mat for it too. Right. Yes, there is a play mat for that. Right. Yeah. So, what what you have here is you have six different versions of a rare card. So this rare card would really only get printed as a foil, x number of times in the whole print run. So when you take that and you multiply it by six, well then the percentages get thrown even more out of whack, and these cards are even harder to find. So. I mean, again, like I said, we don't have the hard numbers, but I think a lot of these foil cards are extremely expensive because they are going to be very, very hard to find and very rare. Um, yeah. You know, like I said, very cryptic command. You've got um, a lot of the commons, um, like what was it, Beast and Show. I know that has different mm -hmm. art. Um, I, yeah, I can't go through them all right now, but there's so there, there's a bunch, many. Yeah. yeah, there's so many more cards that, are in this set than we were originally aware of that yeah the foil printings are going to be a lot more rare so uh, that's that's my best guess is in terms of you know what's contributing to these insanely high price tags for these cards is there, well, there is there, there anything is else you can think of that might that is it contributing to insane is just that it's the rarities i mean yeah you're right 
the matter of fact that you can't get many of these cards. You may get one of these rares. Like, every thingamajig's got six versions, too. Right. Uh, it's just a matter of getting them. Right. And getting the right one. Yes. And we could be seeing um, something that I'm going to refer to as the expedition effect, where the week that you began opening uh, Battle for Zendikar, you know, f the uh, Expedition Scalding Tarns were selling in the, like, $400 range. Yeah, they um, were. Because it was brand new, you know, they were very, very I hard mean, to come by. Uh, and then as the printings increased, as they were thrown into the standard showdown packs, uh, they knew that, you know, we were going to be seeing these more and more, the value began to drop. Um, now, that's not to say that they're going to be putting these foil, unstable cards <laughs> in Saturday showdown packs, but um, I definitely think we're going to see the price on some of these decline as more and more people draft it. It's been extremely successful. Um, I mean, like you were saying, you heard a lot of people were indulging in the uh, in the unstable drafting. I just keep hearing story after story of you know all these unstable drafts firing off time and time again. Yeah. So um, hopefully we've got enough product to, to to manage that because all through this holiday season i think a lot of people are going to be going to game stores looking to draft unstable yeah well i mean i was in target earlier this morning and they have draft packs sitting on their shelves of unstable yeah ready to go ready, ready to, to go. fire off at a moment's notice mm -hmm. so um also 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 there's one other factor about why some of these foil rare cards might be a little harder to come by. Um, there are god boxes, if you haven't yeah. uh, heard. And this ver this is what the god box is kind of in reference to was, um, I guess back in, you said Journey into Nyx, is that correct? Uh, the first god box, I want to say that sounds about right, Journey into Nyx. Okay, well, there were god packs yeah. Where when you open the god pack, every single yeah. card in there, it was one of each of the gods from yeah. Theros, Born of the Gods, Journey into Nyx. Um, so, you know, one pack had just gold in it, and it was mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, well, what happened here in Unstable, and I'm not sure if this was done uh, as a reaction to people saying that the value of the set wouldn't be that much, um, there are boxes that every single pack contains a foil full art land. Now, yeah. that does ridiculous things for uh, the value of this set. Um, yeah. You know, people might say, oh, I'm not going to buy a box, I'm just going to buy singles down the road, build my cube, whatever. But, you know, we're magic players, we like buying packs, we like buying boxes, so there is that, <laughs> there is that carrot being dangled out in front of you of, oh, hey, you want to buy a box? If you buy a box, you could open all foil full art lands. So, I mean, my gosh, that okay. So, so these lands, these foil lands, are ranging anywhere from fifty to ninety bucks. Yes, right? mm -hmm. fifty so, to ninety bucks each. Yeah. So you open a pack, a, a box of thirty-six packs, times you know, let's just average that out to to sixty-five or seventy. That's that's a pretty pretty valuable box. I mean, yeah, yeah, no, it's really dumb. And with some people, they're saying that um, they're getting uh, somewhere to around. Some of these boxes are opening all the same land, so if it's all islands, it's ninety dollars per pack. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're, we're talking these boxes could be the most valuable boxes you open ever. Yeah, so it it's just kind of outrageous. I, I'm dumbfounded honestly right right now um it's also to be noted in terms of this being you know possibly one of the most valuable boxes you could open back in the days of zendikar there were the boxes that you could open or the packs that you could open with the priceless treasures in them and yeah those ones would hold an insanely high value as well yes well yes because i, I mean you could open mox and you can open lotuses but uh, even op having something like that be possible with a pack, you could never guarantee something. I mean, we're seeing these uh, god boxes. What it seems like, some people are seeing it as one in every six cases. Some people are even going as far to say that they opened a case and it had nothing but foil lands. Right. I, like I mean, a, it, like if they're really case. doing god cases, that's kind of outrageous. I haven't seen any truth to this, but... Um, 
God, I mean, pay six hundred dollars <laughs> and you get ten thousand dollars ish. I mean, yeah. Here, let me just. Okay, well, you know what? All right. Since, since we're dealing times six. facts here at the win condition, let me pull up my calculator here real quick. If you were to average what, let's say seventy bucks for those foil lands, times fifteen thousand, you open a twenty-five hundred dollar box. Boom. Well, yeah, but if it's one of those cases, if that's truly true, and there are god cases, that's fifteen thousand. <laughs> so, I mean, the uh, the allure is out there. The allure oh. is what drives us to want to open up these packs. So Yeah, that does. If you find yourself in a store and you open up a pack and you pull a foil land, you open up another pack, you pull a foil land, you better shell out and buy the rest of those packs. Yeah, you should. Ch chances really. are you will not be disappointed. Um, and then also, just circling back to what we were saying before, if there are boxes or cases with nothing but full art lands, then again, that takes away potential printings of other foil rares in the set. Right. So, I mean, there's all kinds of metrics, all kinds of factors that will play in here, but ultimately, there are some cards in Unstable that are worth a lot of money and really make this set uh, more than worth buying. So, I mean, you've already got the fun factor of actually drafting them. Um, Greg and I are actually uh, in the process of making some commander decks. Seeing, I as, mean, you are. Well, you've already got it done. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> taking advantage of the unsets involved in the commander world. Yeah. So, um, but you know, if you do take your commander deck to a local game store and it's some sort of an event where there are prizes involved, like Friday Night Magic, um, I know my local game store will have commander pods of four uh, whenever you know Friday Night Magic happens. But it would still just be a general good rule of thumb to say, you know, hey guys, y'all are playing uh, silver bordered cards, right? Because I am. And I mean, it's not like they can say, well, no, you can't. But, you know, it's just, it's the season of craziness. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's much more fun to have everybody know kind of what's going on than if you were to, you know, say all of a sudden cast better than one, go and grab someone else, and they sit down. Now they're your commander <laughs> teammate. And the whole pod was like, uh, what just happened? <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, gosh, the, the, just what could happen is outrageous. Yeah. And I think that the success of Unstable is um, just a testament to how creative the development team actually can be at Wizards of the Coast. I mean, yeah. this this set was years, decade even? Uh, maybe not 13. a decade. 13. 13. Yeah. Uh, but long, long time in the making. So, um, But what I hope, what I really hope, this does not spawn a an unset every, every two years. Yeah, I really don't want to see that. That will get that will get old very fast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, like but very very fast. The amount of oh uh, god, I just couldn't think about it. It'd be like yeah no. Mm -mm. Yep, yep, yep. So you can shove all the master sets. You can shove all the new sets you want down our throat, but just don't shove un un sets down our throat constantly. I don't know. I want them to slow down on the release of master sets. I mean, we had what two this year? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's and too much. I'm sure that there's already people out there thinking, when's the Unmaster set going to come oh, out? God, <laughs> please, no. That hopefully won't happen for like 20 years. But anyway, um, so Unstable, it's awesome. Go out and yeah. play it if you haven't already. Um, the lands are just gorgeous, and you can play them in Commander through January 15th. Well, so. the lands you can play any time, but... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that Steam Flogger boss, man. You could throw that into any deck you want. That's true. All right. So, let's move on from Unstable. And um, we got a listener email. So, why don't we go ahead and dive into the mailbag? <laughs> there a letter for me Ooh, there's a letter for you there's a letter for me too nice i like it 
So um, what we have here is a gentleman who is particip. Okay, here, you know what? Let's just read it so we can give everybody an idea. I'll, I'll do my best to move quickly so we can get through this here. So Kyle, thank you very much for the email, writes to us, Hello, gentlemen. I'm looking for some ideas. My local playgroup is having our next all-day magic event, and they are running a five-player chaos match. And here are the rules. It's modern format, no infinite combos, no one, tur no turn one wins, 45-minute time limit for each round. Everyone donates two rares to enter. You get your pick of the rares when you eliminate someone. The rest of the rares all go to the final winner. After 45 minutes, the winner of each table is chosen at random. You can buy back in for next round for another two rares. Five-person chaos free-for-all at each table. So that's insane. Like, I am all for people coming up with their own formats of ways to play with their friends. This sounds mm -hmm. fun. So then he continues. He's thinking about the deck that he's trying to build to play in this event. Uh, he's thinking he wants to build some sort of gutter snipe slash firebrand archer deck mixed with a bit of storm and lots of small one-mana instants and sorceries. However, he has lots of time. This is the one time of the year that he plays competitively, so he wants to win. Any creative or crazy ideas for something like this? Love the show. It's a great mix of news, lore, and all-around magic goodness. Thanks. Kyle. Well, Kyle, thank you so much for the email. We really appreciate it, and we appreciate being able to bring you this cast every week and hope it's some form of value to, to everybody out there who's listening. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so what we have here is a free-for-all multiplayer format. Um, he wants to run Gutter Snipe, which is right. a 2-2 two, two Goblin for two and a red that says whenever you cast an instant or sorcery, Gutter Snipe deals two damage to each opponent. Yeah. And then he's running Firebrand Archer. Firebrand Archer says whenever you cast a non-creature spell, it deals one damage to each opponent. So okay. this also hits on artifacts. Right. Right. Or Planeswalkers. Or Planeswalkers. I right. mean, Chandra the Firebrand works pretty good here. Yeah. Definitely. How would you like to copy spells? <laughs> oh wait was it that one of the thoughts I had I, I mean if you're already going to be in red I was thinking you could go blue and add in like twin casts and wild ricochets and all those fun cards that allows you to recast or copy other people's spells so you get to use their decks against them right right um, and you know being a, a, a multiplayer format with five players um, you know Gutter, uh, not gutter, sorry. Uh, gut, bleh, why can't I say this card? Grape Shot, thank you. Grape Shot uh, isn't going to be your, your form of finisher because um, you'll probably be trying to take out as many players as possible and right. you can only storm so much um, with a Grape Shot. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're not even going to think about Grape Shot right now. Um, but what we are going to think about is how to activate these triggers as effectively as possible. So, um, right off the bat, if we're going to be running a Storm deck, we're probably going to want blue so that we mm -hmm. can include cards like Goblin Electromancer and Baral. Yep. Because, I mean, why not make these spells cheaper while you're doing it? Exactly. So, um, I know in our previous episode when we were talking about Modern Storm, um, w just one of those creatures can cause your, your ritual spells, like Desperate Ritual, Paretic Ritual, to only cost you one mana. Mm -hmm. So if you have one of each of these out, Gutter Sniper, Firebrand Archer, that's one mana to get yourself three mana and do three damage to each opponent, which is pretty huge. It's it's pretty good. Right. Um, also, we're not really looking to do much uh, in terms of direct damage, but we are going to want to draw cards with efficient, cheap spells. Yeah. So one of my first suggestions in the card draw category would be Think Twice from the Innistrad block, because Think Twice is an instant for one and a blue, and it just says draw a card. But it has flashback for one and a blue. Again, draw a card. So if you have your um, Baral or your Electromancer, you get to play this for one, and get two triggers out of it. So again, if you have your uh, gutter snipe and your archer, 
you cast your thing twice, that's three damage. You flash it back, that's three more damage. That's six damage to everyone else at the table for two blue mana. That seems pretty strong. Mm -hmm. I like it. I mean, you could even add on things like, uh, what is it, Talrand? Yeah. I mean, like a one or a two of in there, so each time you're getting two twos, it helps out. Yeah, definitely. Um, or, um, or, it, or it, of course, Young Pyromancer. Give yourself yeah. one ones even cheaper. I it, Going this route, though, if you really want to go with this, uh, Perforo seems like a good include, too. Right, well, and, and that that is definitely another direction you could take it with. Uh, but then you run the risk of going... Uh, I mean, uh, well, that's not really much of a risk because most of your cards that will produce multiple like token creatures are sorceries. Um, so, yeah, you could definitely double up on that. Um, yeah, if you were to run, um, you know, Perforos, and then if you were to go that route, you could even grab Impact Tremors. You know, Ugh. it's kind of the same deal, but with creatures where you're doing that damage to everyone at the table, um, I mean, shoot, just let's, let's, let's lay the table out here. You've got your Gutter Snipe, your Firebrand Archer, and a Perforos out, right? And let's say you just cast, um, oh my gosh, Molten it's the Konzatark here, Sorcery, one and two red, put three one one goblin creature tokens out in the battlefield. Oh yeah, yeah. I can't think of the name of the card. Right, uh, but something like that. You're immediately triggering the damage from your gutter snipe and your firebrand archer. Plus, you get six more damage from those creatures entering the battlefield with perforos. Yeah. Tack on another three if you've got impact tremors. Um, but you know that's you know that's definitely one way you could take it. Um, Another piece of of tech that I was uh, actually was probably the first card that popped into my mind, just because I've been looking for an excuse to run this card since it came out and have been very unsuccessful. But I think you might actually have something here with it. Um, the card's called Twin Flame, from I want to say Journey into Nyx. That sounds about right. It's one in a red for a sorcery, and it says put a copy of target creature you control onto the battlefield. It gains haste, exile at the beginning of the next end step. And this, this card has Strive, so for two and a red, you can add targets to this spell. Now, that, that is pretty mana intensive, but if you think about it, if you have just an Electromancer and, let's say, an Archer out on the battlefield, uh, oh, and then let's say you have a, yeah, an Electromancer, uh, uh, a Gutter Snipe, and an Archer on the battlefield, you can cast Twin Flame for one, copying your Gutter Snipe, that spell alone will do the three damage to each of your opponents. But now, for the remainder of that turn, you've got two gutter snipes on the battlefield. That thing twice you want to flash back will do four damage to each opponent. So yeah. you're going to have an explosive turn here if you're able to copy your gutter snipe and possibly your archer as well. Um, I mean, if you're running things like Snapcaster Mage, you know, you could go... Twin flame my snipe, snap mm -hmm. back my twin flame, copy my snipe again. Now every spell's doing six. So if you're running those cheap cantrips, you're refilling your hand as well as damaging your opponent. I mean, there's a lot of ways that you could take this deck, and we don't want to get you too diluted in what your focus is. We just want to give you ideas of cards that would make this engine go. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I, those, those are the ideas that I was thinking. I mean, taking advantage of your spells seems like a great idea because um, you're going to cast them anyways. Why not get better value out of them too? Right. Now, this kind of led me down a tangent of, okay, you're a damage-based deck. What happens when you sit down across the table from... And I know you said no infinite combos, but in a multiplayer game, life total actually becomes a much more important resource. Because if you're fighting against everyone at the table except for maybe one or even two guys and their deck revolves around them gaining life, well, that could be a problem. Because sure. if they're gaining all this life, I mean, Kitchen Finks, I mean, obviously if there's no infinite combos, they're not going to be gaining infinite life, but you're going to want to make sure your strategy works, which is why I would also recommend running a card like Skullcrack. Or, or how about... How about rampaging for Osidon? That was the next one I was going to mention. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I mean, rampaging for Osidon, as well as making sure they can't gain life, 
will also have the reverse perforos effect, where every creature they put on the battlefield, they take damage. Well, you do too, but... That's true. That's true, but we're, we're, we're trying to cast more instants and sorceries here. True. Uh, if you're playing Rampaging Ferocidon, don't play the Perforos Impact Tremors version. That's just a yeah, little, definitely. little too nombo y there. Um, it also, hurts a bit much. Um, if you're playing against somebody who's playing, like, you know, a Perforos deck, or uh, I'm, I'm just trying to think, like, you're going to be sitting at a table with other people who have a mindset of they need to be doing all this stuff to everybody. Um, so if you are concerned about damage, um, then this, okay, so so Greg, I want you to tell us about your idea of splash and black here, what, that, what, what you could uh, gain from this here. Well, if you splash black, you get to add in things like tendrils of, uh, tendrils of agony is not legal. Never mind that one. But um, <laughs> things like whip of Erebos. What does whip of Erebos do in this deck, Greg? Well, it says uh, two generic, two black, legendary enchantment artifact. Uh, creatures you control have lifelink. And then for two generic, two black tap, as a sorcery, you could turn a creature from your graveyard to the battlefield. So essentially, it makes your gutter snipe, your firebrand archer, all of them have lifelink. So when they're doing that damage out from you playing non-creature spells and instants and sorceries, you're just gaining that life back, especially if you go like the creature out with impact tremors and perforos. If perforos becomes a creature while you're doing this, uh, sure, gain two life per each player and each creature you put into play. So you put a creature out, you gain eight life if everybody's not dead yet. Yeah, it, it, it's a big swing. It's a challenging right. swing because I mean, it makes you go the long game. <laughs> yeah, because obviously it, the the whip I believe is what two black black for. Yeah. Uh, here, let me pull it up here. No, it's two black black. Two black black. Okay, for legendary enchantment artifact, um, and then it's two black black again for its uh, for its ability. So splashing, uh, it would seem kind of hard, but my gosh, giving your creatures life link in this type of deck in this type I mean, of situation. Seems like it would put you out of reach from any of your opponent's attempts to kill you through damage. So since you feel this is a hard splash, why not use something like um, one of the bonds? Uh, I think it's uh, ex Exquisite Bond or Sanguine Bond. W one of those two says whenever an opponent is dealt damage, you gain that much life. Um. Oh. Oh, Exquisite Blood. Exquisite Blood. I think blood. it's Exquisite right. Blood. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, we're we're talking. You might be pulling this into a a, a Grixis build. Um, you could even go red black. Um, but again, these are all just ideas to kind of get the the creative juices flowing here. And if you don't want to go black, um, you could sort of streamline it a little bit more with uh, just using something like Basilisk Collar. Uh, mm -hmm. Put it directly on your gutter snipe because even one gutter snipe at a table of five people. That's going to be eight damage and eight life you gain every time it goes off. Now, the death touch is a little irrelevant, so you know don't worry too much about that. But we want to keep you alive in time so that you can actually combo off and kill everybody at the table. Um, so, And then for you know your cheap cantrips, obviously we talked about Think Twice. Um, you know, you could run your... I mean, Serum Visions is good, but, I mean, it's a it's a sorcery. I mean, it's still good. It's a cantrip. It's going to trigger all your stuff, and it is cheap, so you probably are yeah. going to want to run that. Um, things like... Uh, Harness the Storm. Right. Oh, yeah. Gifts yeah. Ungiven. Yeah, and it, it, if, you're gonna, if you're going the Storm route, then you might even want to go with uh, 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 Faithless Looting. Yeah. Because... It's cheap. It draws you two cards. It puts two cards in your bin that you can get access to later. Well, I mean, with, so it's um, like things like Manamorphose, too. Yeah. Yeah, if you're running the uh, Past and Flames, you know, everything that goes to your graveyard, you can get back with uh, with Past and Flames later on. Um, now, I know you were saying competitive. I know you were saying, you know, that, uh, well, yeah, you want to keep this deck competitive, but... Um, I guess, unfortunately, we don't know what all your opponents are going to be bringing to the table. We don't really know the meta that well. Um, if people are looking to be aggressive, like if you get those players that want to suicide into somebody and just take somebody out, like an Infect player, um, then you just are going to have to bring your, your, your politicking skills to the table. You know? Um, 
I'm definitely, like I said, I'm going to try to steer clear of the targeted removal with this, like lightning bolt or anything like that. But, um, yeah, it's it's interesting. Very, very interesting. I think this format is fascinating. I would love to do something like this with a group of friends uh, when I get time, if possible. Or a life. Yeah. That, that's, you know, not your kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, boy. Uh, gosh. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. So, I mean, and then also, one other last note, if you are in, again, a multiplayer game, extra turns are usually very, very good because it's one of your turns to four other people's turns. So would you say something like Lighthouse Chronologist would be good? Well, I'm yeah, I'm just saying, if you're running things like Baral and Electromancer... Yeah. You know, making a, a, a time warp cheaper, um, it would be, you know, in your best interest, especially if you're trying to set up your, your kill turn and you just need that one extra turn to, to set yourself up. Uh, not to mention, time warp triggers your um, your gutter snipes. Um, and again, if it's a multiplayer game and it might go long, then this might be uh, exactly what you're looking for. Yeah. Um, and, oh, man. That's right. Cards like Final Fortune and stuff aren't legal. <laughs> in modern no, day. no, you, you can't play um, Final Fortune. Sorry, but uh, but yeah, it, it's just uh, again something that kind of crossed my mind because you're gonna have to fight off four people, and if you give yourself extra turns to deal, then that's gonna be that much more of an advantage that you have over the entire table. What is that delve card from Fate Reforged? That gives um, you an extra turn. Yeah, I'd forget what it's called. Temporal but trespass. It, temporal trespass. So this could kind of give you another out. Uh, obviously, if you're storming and you need your graveyard, you probably wouldn't want to play this. But the fact that you might have the option to take an extra turn for three mana, if you just say, you know, see a graveyard. I'm going to do it now. Let's say you have your you know, two gutter snipes and your, your archer, or two archers, whatever your, your, your pleasure. And for three mana, you go, everybody take six or seven. Uh, I'm going to take an extra turn, you know, untap, draw my card, and then just cantrip, cantrip, and you're pretty much winning right there. And if you have a twin flame, that's just gas. So temporal trespass might do you well in this situation. Um, and then obviously if you're running things like Twin Cast or uh, Reverberate, that could make things get even nastier. Because Reverberate just seems to be such a good card in this situation, as well as Twin Cast, because you're like, I'll take two extra turns. I'll copy my Twin Flame, make extra copies of my guys. Um, I'll copy my card draw spell, I'll draw extra cards, all the while doing more damage with your creatures that you have out on the battlefield. Um, now... Obviously, if you're playing a big game, people will probably be running board wipes. And I was not too thrilled about the idea of running counter spells in this deck, just because you're going to have to counter like four different decks at a time. So um, it, that kind of left me at a loss when dealing with how to how to handle board wipes. Um, and it's red and blue. I mean, well, but do you really think people are going to be running a lot of board wipes for a modern chaos? If if they're trying to play competitively here, it's not going to be like the old like a Wild West format of EDH where people do what they want to do. It's people are trying to eliminate other players. That's true. That's true. I just so I just like, again couldn't help but think in the corner of my mind of any any corner case scenario that could kind of mess you up because you are relying on your creatures surviving long enough to cast all these spells so that you can combo off uh, where a board wipe would be pretty pretty tough. I can't imagine too many people will be playing that great amount of targeted removal in this format, but, um, you know, I could be wrong. You never know. You never know. It's true. Um, never. But that's just kind of our idea. Yep. So, um, Wow. Kyle, this sounds amazing. This sounds insane. It sounds wonderful. Um, if uh, you know, let us know how it goes too. We would love to hear yeah. the uh, the tournament report on these uh, shenanigans and see how it all pans out. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, there is actually one other thing that I wanted to talk about, 
and I know, Greg, I didn't really go over this with you beforehand, but... Is it because you remembered it just now? It is because I remembered it just now. <laughs> um, Any time that we take an opportunity to get a good deal on cards, or if there's something out there that you would advise we take the opportunity to pick up, not necessarily go deep on, like, you know, some serious investing, MTG finance, what have you, but um, just, just a little note. Um, I went to the card shop on Tuesday, and I actually, uh, my, my, my wife hid 30 bucks in my wallet, and when I got there, she was like, oh yeah, go and just have fun, and all this other stuff, you know, and I was like, oh my gosh, what do I do, what do I do, and you know, Unstable was out, and all this, that, and the other, um, but I ended up buying a card, just one card with it, and I'm here to tell you that if you are interested or do not have any Nahiri the Harbingers, um, specifically I bought a foil one, I would highly, highly recommend getting them now. And here's why. Um, they're at a low, not an all-time low, but they're currently at a low. It just rotated out with the introduction of Ixalan, so not too many people are thinking about, or not as many people are thinking about Nahiri, but... In the modern format, Jeskai Control is seeing a resurgence, and Nahiri is definitely a huge player in the Jeskai Control builds. So, if you don't have any Nahiris, I would definitely recommend going out and grabbing yourself one, because I believe the next time it would be possible to reprint her would be phew, Modern Masters, like, 2021. Because... I'm pretty sure the next Modern Masters set we get, they'll they'll do it up through maybe the Theros block. Um, maybe. Maybe, yeah. Because we did get uh, Return to Ravnica in this, this last one. So, I mean, the only other sets you really have are, um, you know, maybe Theros and then Origins? Or no, Origins was after Khans, wasn't it? Right. <sighs> Dang. So, anyway, yeah, Nahiri was very recent. I don't see her popping up in any kind of product whatsoever uh i think she's too expensive to be printed in any commander product plus i think the next commander product we're going to be getting are the allied color pairs so her being I mean, white and red kind hope. of prevents her from getting a printing there but um all that being said i would just recommend if you don't have any nahiris and you want them now is definitely a great time to go and pick them up so yeah. Ooh, sorry i had a yawn I didn't know I was that disinteresting, Greg. I apologize. I'll try to make no, it more exciting next time. I've only been up since 6 a.m. and just haven't had enough to eat. <laughs> maybe maybe I'll write a rap about my my you know financial advice that I give for, for people here. Or um, maybe not. No, no. <laughs> uh, keep your day job. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, well, we're going to kind of... Keep it a, a short episode this I week. So, uh, we're yeah. heading into the holidays, and uh, just you know, get out there and enjoy your unstable. You know, yeah. go play some commander, go draft. Uh, it's going to be around for another month or so, but then I think once Rivals of Ixalan hits, this is going to be heading in the rearview mirror pretty fast. I think so. a lot of the cards are going to vanish. Yeah. Yep. Oh oh so. oh oh oh! I am so sorry, Greg. I got a little ahead of myself. Did you want to talk legendary creatures? Uh, there's there's a little bit about legendary creatures out of the uh, un unstable, um, but you've got your favorite, which is of course Spike Tournament Grinder. <laughs> it, uh, isn't I, it? It it really is. I mean, it, it's not that. It's like I told you before the show. It's not that I like playing the deck that Spike is in that wins on turn one, going, you know, Soul Ring into Spike into combo piece, combo piece win. Um, it's just, it's fun to think about that kind of stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Go, going back to the old Duels of the Planeswalker puzzles that you can do, and the card pull from here is, you know, it's actually not that vast, because not every card has been banned, you know? So... No. The fact that you can only grab banned cards from from uh, constructed formats does limit it a little bit, but it's fun to think, you know? And let's say you only fetch out two cards from your deck, you know? You're losing four life from casting her. You're losing 
eight life from the first activation. You're losing another eight life from that. So you're down 20 life. If you're playing commander, you're at half your life total. Now, if you can win that turn, I know that's irrelevant, but gosh, that's such a huge chunk of life to be given up for doing that. Oh, no. I, I like my idea of the time vault voltaic key. Time vault voltaic key, indeed. Seems pretty busted. Yeah. 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 Um, um, all right. So, anyhow, enough about Spike. Uh, you, of course, are building Baron Von Count. I am building Baron Von Count, yes. And what's, what's that new tech that you just found out about recently? Okay. So... This is still a little bit in question here because I heard something about, I know I mentioned proliferating the Doom counter, but um, there's there's specifics that uh, refer to a counter and a counter. Now let me elaborate. A counter referred to as in like a plus one plus one counter or a fate, fate counter, um, those are actual counters that you put on a permanent um, the Doom Counter represented on Baron Von Count is more literally a, a, akin to a life counter, um, where it would you know count from one, two, three, four, and five. So mm -hmm. you would unfortunately not be able to proliferate as it is not a counter; it is a counter. Yeah, <laughs> and unfortunately, that's the best I can do to explain it. Um. Now, now here's the tech that we were talking about. And because it's in the season of the uncards, I want to bring your attention to a pet card of mine from the original unglued set. This card is called Giant Fan. For four mana, you get an artifact that says tap two and tap it. Move target counter from one card to another. If the second card's rules text refers to any type of counters, the moved counter becomes one of those counters. Otherwise, it becomes a plus one, plus one counter. It even says, only a villain would unleash a giant fan on anyone. Boom! Baron Von Count, human villain. Oh, Guess you're, what? You're, that's, that's just wrong. <laughs> It works. It has to work. I yes. mean, I, I don't know. I'm going to run it, and if I get a judge call on me on this, then so be it. But, um, yeah, the fact that you can move counters from one permanent to another has always just been something that fascinates me, like moving plus one, plus one counters onto Planeswalkers, turning them into loyalty counters, or moving them onto a permanent uh, that refers to, um, uh, you know, a fate counter or, or anything, any kind of counter out there. Um that's the kind of card that I could see being actually printed in Black Border. Um, I know they have cards that move counters from one card to another, but none that are legal that change the counter type from what a card yes. refers to from one card to the next. So, um, yeah, I'm going to try to run Giant Fan with my Baron Von Count and see if I can put, uh, you know, extra Doom counters on him. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so then we got Dr. Julius Jumblemorph. He's a legendary creature with all creature types. Um, I don't know what type of deck I'd build this with. I mean, it only does stuff where you, whenever you play a host, you get to search for an augment creature. The only problem is, is that if you try to make this your commander, you only get a few hosts and augments that you can play with. So, like, I would always probably be getting the uh, the host angel that destroys stuff and then, like, the land dude that destroys stuff. That way you could destroy stuff when you play a land. Right. I, I don't know. <laughs> what do you think about it? It's it, it's an extremely narrow. It's really good in draft. Otherwise, it's not that great. No, I I I, I think it's good. I think it's uh, definitely worth running out. You know, and and who knows? You might surprise yourself. This thing might end up being a little more OP than you think. Maybe, maybe. Um, then we have another villain from the Dastardly Doom Guild. We have Mary O'Kill. What? You're going out of alphabetical. Well, it is the Unseries set, so we're going to go out of that. Uh, and what Mary O'Kill is, is for five and a hybrid red-black, you get a 5-5 five, five legendary creature, human villain. For one 
a red and a black hybrid, switch a kill bot or marry o kill in your hand with one on the battlefield. So unfortunately, that makes it a little tough to play her uh, as a commander. Um, There's like five kill bots. Yeah. So. And they all have different names. So they can all be played in Commander. True. Very true. Like four um, or five of them. And seeing as she's a red and black commander, you can't run things like the blue artifact tutors, like those creatures and stuff. Yeah. So you would have to use your demonic, vampiric, uh, diabolic tutors to all just go and grab your kill bots. <laughs> but you also got to remember, she only switches with in your hand. So you right. can't get her out of your command zone. You'd have to bounce her to your hand to do the things. Right. Right. So if you are able to, let's say, reduce the casting cost of her, uh, or I'm sorry, reduce the ability cost with something like a, uh, oh, you can't run training grounds, but you can run that, uh, oh, why am I mind blanking here? That stone that reduces ability costs by one. Um, oh, I... I don't know. Hang on. I'm going to find this. I want to say it's hearth Hearthstone. <laughs> uh, heart, Hearthstone? Yes. Hearthstone. There you go. Yeah, it does that for everybody. I mean, sure, it's yep. cute, but I just, I don't think there's a lot of uh, distance here. No. It, it's like, oh, I get to surprise you every once in a while. This seems really good in a cube. Um. Yeah. You could switch her out with a Dr. Julius Jumbo Morph. You could. Because he's a kill bot. Yeah. <laughs> or a Misform Ultimus. But this yeah. is all QB stuff, not Commander. Um, right. Oh, you know what you could do? Hmm. Okay, here you go. I got your combo right here. Wait, would you possibly new blood her? That's not what I was mentioning, but what would that do? <laughs> I mean, if you were to steal her with new blood, uh, you get to do it with vampires. But then you don't really get the bouncer. But hey, whatever. That's true. No, what I was thinking is you run uh, Altar of the Brood and Mana Echoes. Oh, God. So you could just get your kill bots and then just switch her out, go infinite, make everyone mill. That'll work. <sighs> wow. That's... You dream big here at the win condition. <laughs> That's awkward. Oh, yeah. Boy. Yeah. All right. Why don't you take us through the next one, Greg? Uh, Grisilda, Monster Masher. She is a three generic black red. Uh, legendary creature, zombie villain. She's a 4 4. This is essentially uh, Frankenstein's wife. And she says, combined enchanted and equipped creatures in control have menace. And then for three generic black and a red tap, put two target creature cards from graveyards onto the battlefield combined, combined into one creature under your control. So, yes, that means it gains both names. It gains all all creature types it gains both rules text it gains both power and toughnesses um yeah so if you take like a prime time from evil titan a silver primordial it would become a uh 13 mana cost um 11 13 with reach and trample wow and of course it would enter the battlefield and destroy a bunch of stuff and search for two uh lands and put them to play tap so yeah, yeah, talk about some crazy stuff, right? Ta it's just busted. And you can do that with something like Spike. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you Griselda Spike in something else. Oh God, get out of here. That's <laughs> hey, crazy. Hey, um, sadly it's pay life because <laughs> if it wasn't a pay life, you could have done it with Grizzlebrand and then Grizz like gain life from it. That's some weird stuff there. Could you imagine a Spike Grizzlebrand? <laughs> That would be the most powerful creature I think I've I've ever heard of. I mean, unfortunately, Emrakul is not going to be chilling in the graveyard too long. Oh, but Emrakul can't even be played in Commander. So yeah, whoa, I guess Gristlebrand and Spike this, would be the the nastiest of the nasties that I you could can think totally of. do it with Emrakul. Oh my! How gosh. about Emrakul Ulamog, where you ditch them both from like a survival of the fittest, and while well, they're still in your graveyard in response to the triggers, because the triggers on the stack, you <laughs> Grisilda them both out, making it a uh, a what a twenty three twenty three flying trample indestructible can't be targeted by spells or abilities, annihilator ten. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> See, this is why it's fun to play a little bit of. 
unsatisfying. But remember, commander. you got to have Spike to do it. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Jeez. Oh, my gosh. Um, well, before we leave the League of Dastardly Doom, I did want to point out, I know I mentioned the one card from my deck, but there were a couple other ones that I was uh, a little, I was pleasantly surprised with finding out that they satisfy quite a few of the numbers here involved in Baron Von Count. Um, have we mentioned what Baron Von Count does? We did in our Unstable preview episode. That's we right. did. We talked about him. We already know. He kills stuff okay. and players, right. destroys players. We didn't talk about the big idea, though. Oh, we did not talk about the big idea. That's right. That's some more of this League of Dastardly Doom business. Do you want to – I know you have I, some experience I, with the I, big idea. I, I like the big idea because I've got big ideas. <laughs> oh, well, you know, then why don't you tell us what the big – tell us about the big idea. What's the big idea, Craig? Uh, it is a four generic red-red uh, Brainiac villain. Yeah, that's, that's right. He's a Brainiac. Uh, and what he says is two generic hybrid black-red, black-red. So that's four. Tap. Roll a six-sided die. Create a number one one red Brainiac creature tokens equal to the result. I, I mean, that's already great. Then you can tap three untapped Brainiacs you control. The next time you would roll a six-sided die, instead roll two six-sided dice and use a total of those results. Now, to make this even better, there's a bunch of Brainiacs in the set, like Inhumaniac and Rage Maniac. So you get to have additional Brainiacs on top of these guys. Jeez. And you're in black and red, so you also get to run something like Conspiracy to make all creatures you control Brainiacs. Why not tap and add extra dice? <laughs> and then and then you can use Clark's other thumb. So whenever you roll one die, you roll two dice, and then take one of their choice. And of course, you're running Perforos in this deck, right? I mean, why would you not? <laughs> Impact Tremors too. Dumb. Hey, we could add in a black market. And it's red. It's red black. Oh, you're right. Oh, you're right. Look at that ability text. You, oh, uh, savage. Uh, That's hey, awesome. What can I say? I'm a brainiac. So. <laughs> whew, okay. So we'll have to look into a commander deck with the big idea. Hey, I got a foil soon. one. Um, but yeah. What what these what some of these cards do is they they bring out cards that we would never ever in a million years have thought that we would be using, um, but it some it it makes some cards more useful than I've ever thought possible. So, um, for uh, for Baron von Count, I just want to read a couple cards that because when when you make the Baron von Count deck, you want to use cards that have. The, as many of the number one through five in their casting cost, text box, yeah. and power and toughness. Um, so doing a gatherer search to try to find all this stuff was extremely excruciating, but I came up with a couple really cool ones. Um, to start, um, let's take a look at Serpentine Spike, which is five red red for a sorcery that has Devoid, so this card has no color, uh, but Serpentine Spike deals two damage to target creature, three damage to another target creature, and four damage to a third target creature. If a creature would die this way, exile it instead. So that satisfies your two, three, four, and five numbers for your Baron Von Count. Um, getting a little uh, a little sillier, uh, I'm running Jack in the Mox, which is a zero-drop artifact from Unglued, uh, and you tap to roll six-sided die. Uh, on a one, there's your one, sacrifice Jack in the Mox and lose five life. And then two, three, four, five, and six um, all refer to a specific color of mana that will... Oh, wait, I can't run this. Dang no, it. no. But you know what you can run in its stead? What's that? There's a science fair project. Can run there's a science fair project. That is correct. Wow. I just played myself. Um, no, but then uh, there's this creature called Dust Stalker. I never, ever thought I would be using Dust Stalker in a deck. But for two, a black and a red, you get an Eldrazi with Devoid and Haste. Uh, at the beginning of each end step, if you control no other colorless creatures, return Dust Stalker to its owner's hand. And it's a 5-3. So while it only has a 2, a 3, and a 5 on it, uh, it will come back to my hand at the end of the turn allowing me to use it again so I can knock off that 5, I can knock off a 3 and a 2, 
um, just definitely a multi-purpose um, card there. Yeah. Um, couple. Uh, oh, and then Blood Gift Demon. This is a good one for three black black. You get a five four, and it says uh, it's a demon flying at the beginning of your upkeep. Target player draws a card and loses one life. So one, three, four, and five on that one. Um, just a couple planeswalkers here. Uh, Koth of the Hammer costs two red red. Loyalty abilities are plus one, minus two, and minus five. Starts with a three loyalty, and its first ability creates a four four red elemental creature. So it has all one through five on that. Sark in the Mad, three red and a black. Uh, its abilities are zero, two, and four, and it creates a five five red dragon creature token. So two, three, four, five. Um, and then the last little bit of spice that I have here is possibility storm and what possibility storm is it's three and two red here we go it's an enchantment whenever a player casts a spell from his or her hand that player exiles it then exiles card from the top of his or her library until he or she exiles a card that shares a card type with it that player they may cast that card without paying its mana cost then he or she puts all exiled cards with possibility storm on the bottom of his or her library in a random order so what that means is you cast a card and baron von count's trigger happens on cast so you cast the spell then you start looking through, Doom Counter gets moved, you cast another spell. Chances are you'll have a number on that, it gets moved again. Um, would you by chance run Sunbird's Invocation then? That's what I'm going to put in instead of Jack in the Box. Perfect. Yes, because then every time you cast a spell, you get to cast another spell. Yep. And you yep, get to yep, choose yep. it, and it just has to be a lower a, a, a CMC of the card you cast or lower. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. As long mm -hmm. as it shares that creature type, or yep. I mean the card type, you're good to go. Um, okay, well, wow, we've managed to fill out the rest of the episode here. Um, anything else you wanted to talk about for uh, Unstable? Nah, I, I think most of them pretty much talk to themselves, like X and, and Phoebe and old Buzzbark. So, right. Uh, maybe, when, maybe when I get my hands on some more Unstable, we can experiment and branch out with some other commanders. <laughs> maybe. Yep. Maybe. Hey, Greg. What? Where can you, know you find can... us? What's that? Where can you find us? Well, what I was going to say first is you can find uh, God Boxes of uh, Unstable at Flipside Gaming. When you order <laughs> products from FlipsideGaming.com, you could order that God Box of Unstable uh, with all those foil full art lands. Um, but either way, any order that you have over $10, uh, use that promo code WINCONDITION in all caps to save 10% off your purchase, which will help us fund our future show giveaways. Now, Greg, why don't you tell us where we can find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at NoobSlasher2003. You can find me on Twitter at MTG underscore Sean. The show is at The Wind Condition. We are on Instagram. Uh, as the wind condition mtg you can send us an email at the wind condition podcast at gmail.com check out our youtube page we got a link up in the show notes all that being said greg thanks again oh, of course no problem no and problem we will talk to y'all next week yes all right guys bye